So our first speaker is Eva Zabo. She's the uh, chief of the lung and upper air digestive cancer research group at the NCI Division of Cancer Prevention. She graduated from Yale, and then she got her MD from Duke University. She did uh, internal medicine residency at the Bellevue New York University Medical Center. And then she came to NCI and did a fellowship. And she's going to talk to us today about non-small cell lung cancer. Eva. Thank you, Terry. Can you guys hear me? Uh, is this okay? Uh, it's so strange to talk to just a small number of people, but uh, the best are here. So thank you for showing up in, per uh, in, uh, in person. Okay, so we're going to talk about lung cancer today, uh, and primarily non-small cell lung cancer. Um, the reason this is so important, if you look at, this is worldwide incidence, and each of these is a uh, specific kind of cancer. So you see that maybe 10, 15% of all cancer deaths, um, or all cancer, comes uh, is uh, lung cancer. But when it comes to the uh, percentage that is due, uh, percentage of deaths due to lung cancer, it's much more than that. It's more like 30%. So this is a tremendous uh, source of morbidity and, more important, mortality uh, in the world. So just <clears throat> looking at the statistics uh, in the United States uh, over the last year, um, estimated 228,000 new cases, that's lung and bronchus, um, 142,000 estimated deaths. This is going up every year, um, mainly because the population is increasing. But it is the leading cause of cancer deaths, uh, greater than the next three leading causes of cancer deaths added together. Uh, nevertheless, the good news is that the death rate per 100,000 people has been decreasing. And you see it here. Uh, this is uh, uh, men, uh, peaked uh, incidence of death, uh, peaked around the 1990s. Um, this is all about tobacco. Tobacco uh, epidemic peaked uh, in the 1950s. Um, and there's a 30, 40 year uh, gap. And then as we started seeing uh, decreased uh, tobacco usage, slowly the number of deaths is uh, starting to decrease. But it's still a huge number, as you can see, much greater than everything else. For women, uh, the peak came a little bit later because uh, women started smoking later because of, of various issues of inequality. And so women had to catch up. And there you have it, they also peaked and finally, that peak is also coming down. So um, we are doing better. Uh, there are fewer deaths per 100,000, but increasing number of cases absolute altogether. And we are seeing some improvement, albeit small, in five-year survival. It used to be 5% in the 1950s, 12% in the 70s, and now we're up to 18 to 20%, which in the many years that I've been giving this uh, talk, uh, it's nice to see it actually go up uh, up to 20%. So the risk factors are primarily tobacco. 85% of lung cancer uh, is due to tobacco. That also includes passive smoking, so people who have a lot of exposure to partners at home or the workplace. Uh, a prior uh, aerodigestive malignancy is one of the biggest uh, risk factors for a future one. And um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is yet another independent linked uh, in that COPD is also seen with tobacco exposure, but there are some um, uh, familial uh, COPD uh, genes, and those people, even if they don't smoke, still have increased risk of lung cancer. And this is my favorite old slide that tells you everything you want to know about lung cancer, okay? So here's the cancer. This is a CT scan. Here are changes that you would see with COPD. There's fibrosis, it's a little bit hard to see that these are bigger um, uh, gaps where you have destruction of the alveoli or bully. And then here you have the pack of cigarettes, uh, even as this person has been diagnosed uh, still smoking. Um, there are nevertheless other exposures. Uh, radon is the second most common uh, leading cause of lung cancer. Asbestos, a very important one. We all think of mesothelioma, 
with asbestos exposure, but in fact, more people get lung cancer from asbestos than mesothelioma because lung cancer is so much more common. Many people who have exposure to, to asbestos also have exposure to tobacco. And then a whole variety of uh, environmental exposures uh, often associated with, um, uh, with the, uh, the workplace. There are genetic predispositions as well. A rare uh, germline mutation in the epidermal growth factor receptor, uh, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, um, gives you familial lung cancer, totally independent of tobacco exposure. Um, and then uh, a whole lot of other not nearly as important in terms of uh, um, what percentage of lung cancer they're responsible for, um, but uh, uh, for instance, uh, the acetylcholine receptor subunit, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit have been found to be associated with lung cancer. And some of these are also uh, uh, risk factors or, or uh, give you genetic uh, susceptibility uh, to COPD. So there is some uh, coming together uh, for these two disparate uh, uh, diseases. So lung cancer uh, historically has been um, divided into two types of um, histologies. Um, small cell lung cancer, which is a very aggressive disease, which I think you have a separate talk on. Um, uh, sort of, uh, a central disease uh, uh, associated with uh, large uh, uh, tobacco exposure. And then everything else, non-small cell. Turns out everything else is actually many different uh, cancers, both histologically. So about 40% are adenocarcinomas, 20% are squamous cells, 15% are what's called large cells. They have characteristic appearances, characteristic natural histories, and where in the lung uh, they form. For instance, this is peripheral, this tends to be squam uh, central, um, large cell is peripheral, and then a smattering of others. And in the past, uh, the reason we had this, uh, these two categories is because small cell has been known to be very chemotherapy responsive for many years and it was treated one way, everything else was treated the same way. And that is no longer the case. Um, but uh, so we really are interested when somebody's diagnosed these days to know whether it's an adenocarcinoma versus squamous or other. So I'm gonna talk about uh, lung cancer in this continuum because um, lung cancer develops from the normal airways through a series of uh, progressive abnormalities that eventually result in this invasive and metastatic phenotype. And so first we're gonna start out with talking about treatment, which really should be a huge uh, lecture in and of itself. And so I'm gonna give it you a very short shrift so you have sort of the big picture. So lung cancer, like every other cancer, we think of somewhat anatomically. And anatomically, uh, we use what's called staging to determine how we're gonna approach it. So if something, uh, if uh, the lung cancer is very early stage, stage one, it's localized, surgery is the way to go. If it's a little bit more um, uh, locally advanced, but not, with only some lymph nodes uh, uh, nearby, then we generally go with surgery uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy for what's called stage two, when the lymph nodes are uh, involved in the hilum, so not in the central part of the lung, or if we find that actually there was some involvement in the central part of the lung, but we had already done the surgery because that was not recognized pre-surgically. So that's a surgery and chemo, chemotherapy uh, situation. If the um, cancer is known to have spread to the mediastinum, in other words, the center of the lung, uh, where we have all kinds of lymph nodes and uh, the great vessels and so on, then we use combined modality therapy. So that's usually chemotherapy with radiation, sometimes followed by surgery if there's minimal involvement of lymph nodes on the same side as the tumor is. But most of what we deal with uh, is really metastatic uh, cancer. That's as a medical oncologist, that's what I see primarily. And that is a uh, situation for systemic therapy with radiation given as needed to relieve symptoms to prevent problems. Occasionally, we will take out an isolated metastasis, such as in the brain alone. Uh, and that can be uh, associated with 
improved function as well as survival. But for the most part, everybody gets systemic therapy. Now, you're going to talk about small cells separately. That is systemic therapy from the get-go plus radiation when it's still somewhat limited. So um, what used to be a simple discussion about uh, treatment for metastatic lung cancer has become a very complicated discussion because we now approach things much differently. So what Terry didn't say is that we've known each other for um, actually uh, two decades at this point, <laughs> although I'm much, much younger than he is. Um, but nevertheless, um, when I trained as a fellow at MCI, this is all we had, chemotherapy. It was uh, mainly two drugs that increased to uh, various options. Uh, it's all platinum, cisplatin or carboplatin-based intravenous treatment. It's still used, and most people with advanced lung cancer will still get chemotherapy at some point, but not necessarily at the frontline initial diagnosis. So it's definitely used for adjuvant treatment, meaning after you've taken out all the disease by surgery to help ensure that those micrometastatic um, uh, deposits are taken care of. It's used in metastatic disease, but usually not <clears throat> alone anymore, frontline. The, what you have instead is we have targeted therapy and immunotherapy. And targeted therapy is uh, exactly what the name suggests. It is for people who have specific types of molecular abnormalities. I'll show you a list in a little bit. Um, for whom specific drug exi drugs exist. Uh, the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR story, is sort of the poster child, about 20% uh, of um, uh, adenocarcinomas. Um, but it's really a minority. And this is while uh, giving people these oral um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors is uh, very beneficial and leads to prolonged survival. It is not a cure. Um, and um, there, and people still generally wind up having to go to other types of treatments such as chemotherapy. The new kid on the block, which is now not so new anymore, is immunotherapy, which uh, uses, essentially revs up the um, patient's own immune system um, and is now frontline, in frontline use as a single agent, depending on the profile or in combination with chemotherapy. And these days, almost everybody gets it. Almost, not quite. So uh, let's talk about the targetable mutations and how we get to personalized therapy. So if you look molecularly at adenocarcinomas, this is one of the 40% of non-small cells that are adenos, we actually find multiple driver mutations, abnormalities that are responsible for that malignant phenotype. About a quarter, 30% are KRAS. We don't have drugs for that. Uh, about 20% are EGFR mutated. We have multiple very good drugs for that. This is primarily in never smokers. This is in smokers. Um, ALK translocation. We have great drugs for that as well. Uh, now we're starting to get to 5 8% of everybody. And then we have even more uh, rare uh, abnormalities like a ROS1 translocation. We have BRAF mutations, uh, RET mutations. Um, we have drugs that are approved for these guys, almost approved for RET. We have drugs now for NTRAC which you find in other types of cancers as well. MET has a very rare exon 14 skipping mutation that is also targetable. So these, the, as you can see, there are maybe 40% um, or so, 30% uh, of um, these uh, tumors have specific therapies. And the response rates with these specific therapies are excellent, they're 50 to 80% as opposed to 20% for chemo. Typical duration of treatment is more like uh, eight to 14 months, and then you need to go on to something else, whether it be a second line targeted therapy or something completely different. So huge progress, no cures. Okay. 
immunotherapy, on the other hand, is, um, as I said, the new kid on the block and the potential for perhaps even cures. So um, the immunotherapy that is used, I don't know if you've had a melanoma lecture, but uh, in melanoma and in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, it's all aimed at this uh, PD-1, PDL one pathway, the program cell death protein 1, which is uh, the PD-1 is a T cell co-inhibitory receptor. It is uh, involved in regulation of T cell activation. It's, it's part of the body's way of uh, tamping down um, or of uh, dealing with inflammation and with various insults. And in the cancer setting, this pathway is suppressed. Okay? So uh, what it does is it limits activity. Of, so that, let me rephrase that. In the cancer setting, this uh, uh, pathway is um, uh, ramped up because part of the role here is to inhibit T cell activity in the tissues. And the ligands, which are uh, frequently expressed on tumors, are present in many types, uh, although that is not necessarily fully correlated with immunotherapy uh, activity. Uh, but this has become a major pathway uh, for treatment of multiple kinds of tumors. And so what I want to point out is that there are several types of uh, uh, antibodies that are now currently in use. And the reason why this is so um, exciting to people is not because of a high response rate, because the response rate to single agent uh, treatment is generally at 20% or so, but because the people who respond, a number of them have these long, long responses. Some people years out with metastatic lung cancer after having received immunotherapy. And so people are starting to uh, ask, is this actually a cure? Which for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer was never even a possibility and it's not a possibility with targeted therapies or chemotherapies. So this is a very um, exciting development, but it really uh, is applicable to a very small uh, minority of uh, people with lung cancer. So to sort of sum up a grossly inappropriately uh, high level view of treatment of lung cancer, uh, we do it by stage. If a person has metastatic disease, it is now absolutely critical to biopsy to have molecular analysis done. If there's a targetable mutation like EGFR or ALK or ROS1, then you give oral treatment with a targeted agent. If this uh, PD1, PDL1 pathway appears to be involved, for instance, PDL1 is high, then immunotherapy alone with one of the agents is an approved way to uh, move forward. But if PDL1 is low, there's no mutation, then these days we give chemotherapy with an immunotherapy uh, antibody. Or in some cases, if there's uh, reasons to be worried about giving immunotherapy, like somebody has um, uh, autoimmune diseases, which get really uh, ramped up and are the major side effects of immune therapy, then you may do chemo alone or with an anti-angiogenic agent. In the old days, I used to talk about the anti-angiogenic agents like bevacizumab. They're really becoming uh, much less important for the treatment of lung cancer. Okay, I'm gonna pivot now. How do we really make a difference? Um, how do you reduce the morbidity and mortality? Well, we talked about therapeutics, a lot of work, huge uh, effort uh, by pharma, by the government, uh, everybody involved um, to get better therapeutics that will give long-term treatment. But there's a long-term uh, benefit, but there's other ways to do it. One would be to prevent a disease and those at high risk. The other one would be to detect it early. And since I work in the Division of Cancer Prevention and my work deals with prevention, you're gonna hear a little bit more about that. So the best way to prevent lung cancer is to take that 85% that's due to smoking and get rid of it, right? Lung cancer used to be a rare disease in the early 20th century. Um, 
So again, the best way would be prevent those young people from ever starting. What about somebody who has been smoking? Can you actually undo the damage to the uh, lung that has accumulated with repeated exposure? So it turns out that you can to an extent. This is an old study called the Lung Health Study, which was uh, done actually in COPD for people with emphysema. And at the 14.5 year uh, follow-up, what was noted was that people who continued to smoke had a, a death rate of about 3.5 uh, per thousand person years. People who quit uh, and sustained their quitting had more than a 50% reduction in their lung cancer mortality. And people who quit intermittently were somewhere in between. So this tells you <clears throat> that with prolonged uh, cessation, you really can reduce the death rate. What was interesting is that at the five-year follow-up, so this is 14.5 years, five-year follow-up, there was no effect that you could tell. So quitting smoking is important, but you're not gonna see the benefit with regard to lung cancer until years out. And that's because if you continue to smoke, your risk of lung cancer continues to go up, up, and up. Um, and if you quit smoking, you stop that continued increase. So, Quitting smoking is hard. Um, and again, it's a, a sociological uh, and behavioral issue, and, um, uh, and that's not my area of expertise. But I want to uh, emphasize how super important it is at any point during the disease. So how about preventing? So cancer chemo prevention is a field. Um, it is the use of natural and synthetic agents to suppress the process of carcinogenesis. Lung cancer doesn't develop out of nothing. It's a cumulative, uh, uh, it's an accumulation of molecular abnormalities due to the tobacco exposure that affects the entire field. And so cancer chemo prevention seeks to, to reverse that process, to regress those lesions that already have some hit but aren't yet uh, an overt cancer. So treat intraepithelial neoplasia, um, prevent the development of new lesions that have some molecular abnormalities, but they haven't even started to look abnormal yet, and then also to suppress the recurrence uh, of lesions um, that have been, for instance, taken out and now come back as a, uh, as a second, uh, um, as, as post-treatment uh, second cancer. The rationale, is that metastatic cancer still is not curable. I showed you some intriguing uh, data that with immunotherapy, a small percentage of people can have prolonged survival, but by and large, we don't know that they're cured yet, and that's a small percentage. Uh, but we have uh, done much better um, uh, uh, in recent years and have far to go. Cancer, on the other hand, in other settings, such as breast cancer, can be prevented, and we've shown that pretty definitively with large studies using tamoxifen and raloxifene, and I imagine you'll hear about that in the breast cancer lecture. And we can certainly model it <coughs> very well in animals, even for lung cancer, using multiple different agents. And we know that tobacco exposure starts when you're young, but your lung cancer doesn't come till you're in your late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there is this long preclinical phase with increasing histologic and molecular abnormalities. And we, we know the population to go after, namely heavy smokers who have some of these abnormalities. So how do we, how do, we uh, do cancer prevention? How do we move forward? Well, we have a lot of work still left to do to understand the mechanisms. In the setting of cervical cancer, which is known to be caused by the human papilloma virus, the vaccine is 90 plus, 95 percent plus uh, percent effective. If you haven't been exposed and you don't, uh, you don't get the exposure because you've been vaccinated, the cervical cancer will not occur. We know that. So understanding the molecular pathogenesis is the best thing, but lung cancer is much more complicated than cervical cancer. So instead, we turn to preclinical models uh, where we can model the um, 
uh, the disease process, for instance, uh, by giving carcinogens or by introducing uh, the uh, appropriate driver mutations. And we've shown that in the setting of, for instance, colon cancer, non-steroidals like aspirin and Motrin and others uh, can actually prevent the, uh, 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 can prevent tumors in the animal setting. And we have uh, uh, data from the human setting that you can actually prevent the recurrence of polyps and therefore presumably colon cancer itself. We go uh, to observational epidemiology, okay? Um, a lot of the data on colon cancer came from the recognition that people who took aspirin and other non-steroidals, in fact, had decreased incidence and mortality from uh, colon cancer. And finally, we look at clinical trials that use appropriate agents to see, do they have an effect on other diseases? This is how tamoxifen was uh, uh, found to be preventive and raloxifen as, raloxifene as well for breast cancer. So we look throughout the literature, throughout uh, uh, the body of uh, data, um, and then we need to focus on how we move these patients forward. So the idea is to have a target uh, that we can uh, therefore appropriately select an agent that will um, uh, impact that target. Um, it's a lot more difficult in lung cancer because I told you about the different histologic subtypes, right? Um, and so these different progenitor cell lineages have different pathogenesis um, and may need a different intervention. These abnormalities occur over a long period of time. And so it may mean that early on, we want to use strategies that prevent DNA damage. Later on, we want to use strategies that target the abnormalities that have occurred. But of course, in the lifetime of a smoker, they're constantly getting new and new DNA damage from the continued smoking while there are other um, uh, foci uh, that are further along in their molecular uh, progression to cancer. We need to select our cohorts. Um, if you're looking uh, at squamous cell carcinoma uh, uh, prevention, you want to look in the airways where the squamous cells arise. So bronchial dysplasia is what we look at. And I'll show you how, uh, how we do those studies. If we're looking to prevent adenocarcinomas, which arise from the peripheral lung, from the type 2 pneumocytes and the clara cells, uh, we probably need to look at lung nodules on CT scans. And I'll show you examples of how, how we've done that. And of course, for non-smokers, we have no idea how to begin the process because that's everybody who's at risk. A couple of other um, things to think about. Uh, if you're going to treat somebody with cancer, they have something that is imminently uh, lethal, you can give them chemotherapy, you can give them uh, agents that make them very sick, you can take them to surgery where they could die uh, on the surgical table. But if they have an 8% lifetime risk of a lung cancer, um, how much risk are you willing to take? And so we need to balance that risk benefit uh, much more in the benefit and less in the risk side uh, when it comes to cancer prevention. And that uh, ties our hands a little bit in terms of the types of agents we could use. Um, so um, uh, it is a complicated field, but I'm going to uh, give you a couple of uh, uh, vignettes of how we've been approaching it. Because ultimately, if you can prevent cancer, you are going to have a much higher um, effectiveness than if you treat cancer. But you have to make sure that you treat the people for, with preventive interventions who are most at risk for cancer. So uh, let me tell you the inflammation story um, and how that has been uh, um, developed. So there have been data for 50, 40, 50 years about the role of steroids corticosteroid, which are anti-inflammatory, and their ability to prevent cancer in a variety of uh, animal models. The epidemiological data, not, not that much available. Um, studies were gen uh, generally of short exposure uh, or short duration of treatment. Um, there was one study uh, uh, of uh, patients with uh, of, uh, 
uh, individuals with uh, emphysema, COPD, that showed a much uh, a lesser uh, incidence of lung cancer in those who took inhaled stero steroids versus those who did not. But in general, most of the rationale for using, uh, for targeting inflammation for lung cancer has been from animal models. And this is one example. Um, one of the drugs, the budesonide, is used uh, for the treatment of asthma. And giving uh, various uh, amounts of budesonide led to an 80% decrease in tumors in carcinogen-exposed mice. And when you look at what these tumors are, they're primarily adenomas as opposed to carcinomas. So there are many fewer tumors in these carcinogen-exposed uh, um, mice that are given uh, budesonide, and they're less histologically advanced. So how do we take this to um, uh, a clinical trial? Uh, well, we decided to uh, look at uh, premalignant lesion, uh, squamous uh, carcinoma, called bronchial dysplasia. And as you, if you look at the lungs of people who've been exposed to tobacco, you will find increasing uh, abnormalities, starting with normal, all the way through uh, mild, uh, moderate, uh, severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, ultimately to uh, invasive disease. And if you do the natural, look at the natural history of these lesions, turns out that uh, about a third of them uh, will, a third of the uh, people who have them will develop cancer within about a year and a half. So not everybody who's got uh, dysplasia uh, develops cancer, but a significant portion does. Um, not all of these le uh, cancers develop from the abnormal site. Some develop elsewhere in the lung. But the point is that people who have bronchial dysplasia uh, are at high risk for developing a future cancer. Um, and dysplasia is a, uh, a precursor as well as a risk marker. So we did a clinical trial of, uh, of budesonide and inhaled steroids with bronchial dysplasia. Now, these are difficult studies. You have to screen people to find that they have dysplasia. Ultimately, we found uh, about 110 of them. Um, they undergo a bronchoscopy, which is uh, you basically take a tube with a light and you biopsy the abnormal areas. They were given budesonide or, or placebo for six months, uh, underwent CT screening to look at the lungs, and then the endpoints were uh, the number of, of sites and the grade of dysplasia, as well as a number of other biomarkers. Um, unfortunately, this trial turned out to be negative, although we, we, we learned a lot. So about 30% of people had reversion of their dysplasia, complete reversion, uh, regardless of whether they took the uh, drug or the placebo, whereas uh, about 45 to 50% had more dysplasia or worse dysplasia uh, on the repeat bronchoscopy. So these were not different between the intervention and the placebo. But what was somewhat intriguing was that this was really the first time that anybody was imaging the, the whole lung with low-dose CT. And there was a difference in the regression rate of these CT-detected nodules. So that led to a what's really a developing new clinical trials model which is to look at people who have these abnormalities, smokers with these abnormalities, uh, and to look at the low-dose CT detected peripheral nodules. Um, and then when you repeat as part of a screening uh, protocol, uh, you can see whether you have any effect. And so the first study we did uh, with our colleagues in Europe, uh, in Italy, looked at the same drug, inhaled budesonide steroid, um, and looked at the uh, effect on CT detected nodules. And what we found was um, definitely not a home run, but quite intriguing. So most of the nodules were solid and they, they don't change a bit. So when you start imaging people's lungs, it turned out that they had prior insults of various sorts. Um, and so these uh, small solid nodules, which were not felt to be uh, cancer, um, uh, they didn't change. What did change were the non-solid nodules, what we call ground glass opacity. And with a year of inhaled uh, steroid treatment, 
what we found was that these continue to get smaller over time, whereas the placebo did not. They started to get a little bit larger, and there was a statistical significant difference, although this is still just looking at the nodules, not at the actual um, cancers, because there were very few diagnoses of cancer, even during this five-year period. So what are these ground glass opacities? Um, well, it turns out that um, they, some of them at least, are what we call atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, or AAH, which is a precursor to adenocarcinoma. Uh, not all of them. It's anywhere between uh, 25 and 50 percent in various studies. Uh, and this is what it looks like under the microscope. It's a thickening of the alveoli in the lung. Um, and yes? Yeah, so to be determined. So uh, smoking marijuana, for instance, don't know yet about Juul and, and vaping. And that's going to be, I guess, five to 10 years from now, uh, the lecture is going to be quite different. Um, but um, certainly with marijuana, you do get uh, bronchial abnormalities. There are some old studies. Uh, you know, the amount of exposure with marijuana is very different, uh, and the type of exposure with uh, vaping and with Juul and others is also quite different. So um, remains to be determined. Now, of course, you know, and so what, what you're thinking of uh, in terms of the people who died, who got, you know, who get this uh, severe respiratory distress, that is different. That's a big systemic, systemic whole lung uh, kind of issue. Um, what I'm talking about here are these persistent um, abnormalities that you'll see on CT. Uh, and the question is, what do you do with them? Uh, and how long do you follow them? And so um, to make a long story short, uh, we're just now getting the natural history of these abnormalities. About, um, let's see, 1% become cancer, three, five, six, about seven and a half percent over time uh, will become either cancer or a low-grade uh, cancer, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma in situ, or will be found to be this AH. So um, the nodules do need to be followed up, and those are the people who we um, have recently been focusing on. And I'll just give you a very quick example because a picture is uh, worth a thousand words. This is actually a friend of mine who uh, uh, came to our clinic because she had chest pain, went to the ER, and this is what her CT showed in 2004. And here you have this, uh, she's actually had exposure to tobacco, but was, a not, was not a smoker. Um, and here you have this ground glass opacity. And so they said, all right, come back in three months. There it is again. And then everything was fine. And so she didn't come back in a year, which she was supposed to. And then in Six years later, she had another episode of this chest pain, wound up at the ER, they did a CT scan, and now here it is again. But as you can see, it's bigger than it was before. And when that was followed up, um, it had started to become more dense, and it turned out to be an early stage adenocarcinoma with adjacent AAH. So this tells you that's a seven year period of time. These nodules um, take a long time to uh, may take a long time to develop. I'm going to speed through this a little bit, but the bottom line is, uh, and you have these slides, I think, um, bottom line is that these ground glass opacities uh, are associated with increased risk, but future risk. They're not tumors. They're the precursors. Okay, so, um, so how do we move our studies forward? So uh, we did we looked at the anti-inflammatory inhaled steroids, a hint, but not a home run. Um, so we moved on to aspirin, which is another well-known uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, so about, um, I guess, eight years ago at this point, uh, there was a series of studies, meta-analyses, showing that people who take aspirin, primarily for cardiovascular disease prevention, so a number of studies have been done, um, that they actually have about a 20% decrease in death from cancer, all cancers. 
And one of the cancers that was most striking was actually lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma in particular. And what you see here in this little curve is that um, those who took aspirin had a, uh, about a 30% decreased risk of death from lung cancer uh, over the long term. But these curves started to separate within before five years. So within five years, you could tell a difference in terms of lung cancer mortality. So we took this CT nodule uh, model, and this time we only looked at the people who had the ground glass opacity, the increased risk, the ones that had changed in the budesonide study. And we gave low-dose aspirin for a year versus placebo for a year, and our um, and everybody underwent a CT um, pre and post treatment. And so those data are um, in the process of being written up. Um, it was also a negative study. Um, and it may be that, again, uh, the duration is not long enough. We need the long-term follow-up to see whether there's truly an effect. We're also looking at gene expression in the nasal epithelium, which is a surrogate for the bronchial epithelium, to see whether aspirin has effects there as well. So these are all <clears throat> ongoing studies. I will, um, so the take home message is that the rationale for targeting inflammation is huge, very strong for um, preventing lung cancer. But we have struggled with figuring out how to prove that in a short term setting. Okay. Let me show you one other um, uh, agent called myonositol. A, uh, uh, it's an isomer of glucose, uh, actually uh, involved in uh, signaling um, and is a source of, uh, is uh, obtained from rice and many other dietary sources. And a number of preclinical studies showed uh, uh, inhibition of uh, carcinogen induced tumors in mice. Um, they, uh, the efficacy is uh, there, uh, efficacy, the safety is there. It is generally regarded as safe or GRAS designation by the US FDA, which means that you can just use it uh, without uh, uh, needing um, any type of regulatory approval. Um, and so we performed a series of studies. Uh, this is a phase one study where we showed that you can take up to 18 grams uh, very easily. Um, uh, all of these people had bronchial dysplasia, and when compared to historical controls, and that's a caveat, um, we showed a very high rate of regression uh, of bronchial dysplasia. Um, what was interesting was that um, all of these smokers had um, brushings of their normal airways, okay? and um, through a whole series of studies, um, it has been shown that the PI3 kinase pathway is activated in the airways of smokers with dysplasia, and this activation was inhibited by myonositol. So a potential mechanism of how uh, this drug could work. So what we did was a what's called a phase 2B study of myonositol, which took smokers uh, who had bronchial dysplasia, um, uh, more than 30 pack year smoking, um, and treated them for six months with either myonositol or placebo, looking at dysplasia after treatment as uh, the primary endpoint, as well as a number of other biomarkers, including the PI3 kinase gene signature that I just referred to. And it shows why it's so important to have a well uh, performed and randomized study, because uh, even uh, in this setting with great preclinical data and um, uh, very uh, tantalizing phase one data. Once we treated enough people, we were really not able to find uh, a um, demonstrably uh, different uh, regression rate for bronchial dysplasia uh, with myonositol. The PI3 kinase pathway and downstream uh, of its uh, AKT activation uh, really only occurred in those who responded. So it was a correlation, but not a um, good enough marker to tell us 
who we should target for this intervention. Um, but uh, among the many endpoints that were of interest was, again, in inflammation and interleukin-6 in the bronchial uh, uh, um, in, uh, uh, fluid and uh, uh, bronchial, bronchoalveolar lavage that was uh, uh, significantly um, uh, decreased by myonositol. So the summary from this study was that when it comes to bronchial dysplasia, uh, we were not able to find uh, an effect, even though we did find this uh, reduction in IL-6. Um, and the reason I'm talking about that is because there's, again, a whole series of studies in mice suggesting that this is an important mechanism of myoinositol. But really, the current um, uh, data of interest is a secondary analysis from a cardiovascular study called the CANTOS trial, which, uh, which targets interleukin-1 beta, and downstream of it is IL-6. And in this study, which was done, uh, performed in people who uh, had um, ongoing inflammation, uh, who had cardiovascular disease, um, so they had a high uh, C-reactive protein, um, what was most striking was that uh, not only was there an effect in decreasing cardiovascular disease, but there was a reduction in total cancer mortality, about 50%, which was primarily driven by lung cancer mortality and lung cancer incidence, which was down by almost 70%. Um, so um, this gives us a clue that this pathway may be the component of the anti of the inflammation cascade that should be targeted for lung cancer prevention. And so there are ongoing studies, mainly in the planning to address whether using, for instance, the antibody uh, against IL-1 beta could be preventive in the right population. Okay, so to be uh, determined uh, how this works. Let me spend just a few minutes uh, talking about early detection of lung cancer. Again, not doing this justice by any stretch. You would think that something would be easy, and it's not. Nothing is easy. When it comes to cancer screening, it comes with its own host of um, uh, potential biases, we like to call them. So lead time bias. You diagnose earlier, okay, but you don't actually postpone death. You only think that you're uh, doing uh, good because if a person is supposed to die here and you diagnose him normally here, but it's really 10 months earlier, they still die at the same time, you only think that you've done uh, something of value. That's lead time bias. Length bias. You diagnose the more indolent disease with a longer preclinical phase. Those are the people who do better. Uh, they have a better outcome, so you say, great, I'm getting much longer survival in these people uh, who I diagnosed, uh, who I uh, uh, found on screening. But in fact, you're missing all the cancers that are, that are going to kill people quickly. So you think you're doing better than you really are. That's length bias. Third issue, overdiagnosis. Uh, so you, you diagnose the unimportant things that you just pick up uh, and they would have never killed the person anyway. They just happen to be there. You know, if you do autopsy studies of older men, everybody has prostate cancer, almost everybody, 90%, 80%. Um, does that mean that if you find it when they're alive that they would have died of prostate cancer? Absolutely not. Um, there is such a thing in lung cancer as well, shocking as it may be to those of us in the field. So. One has to be very careful uh, to make sure that these biases uh, are not uh, giving you a false uh, sense of uh, progress. And of course, when it comes to uh, screening, everybody who's abnormal, you have to uh, work up. There's morbidity, there's mortality, there's the cost of the screening, cost of the workups, uh, the psychological cost. So all of these need to be um, uh, uh, considered when uh, entertaining a screening trial or a screening program. So for many years, all we had to diagnose lung cancer was chest X-ray. Uh, this study, the PLCO, finally definitively showed that screening by chest X-ray, such as usual care, does not impact lung cancer mortality. Okay. 
case settled. However, screening by CT scan, low dose CT scan or helical CT scan, actually is uh, is effective, um, and that's a much more um, sensitive test. Um, the National Lung Screening Trial, or NLST, uh, was performed um, in uh, early 2000s, uh, read out in 2011, eight years ago. 53,000 plus smokers, all current or former, uh, very carefully controlled. Everybody had either a helical CT or a chest X-ray three times altogether. And uh, essentially what you find is a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. So people dying from lung cancer, actually there's a reduction in all cancer, uh, in all uh, cause mortality, which shows you the outsized uh, impact of lung cancer on health in general. Now it comes at, at a cost, about a quarter of the um, CT scans had a positive result. Um, whereas uh, only 7% of the chest x-rays did. So many more workups. Um, this is what the graphs look like. Uh, it was a aha moment when these were published. Low dose CT, the cumulative number of cancers is more than with chest x-ray, but the deaths from a lung cancer, here's the chest x-ray versus the low dose CT, 20% uh, reduction. So, that's great. Um, the first uh, huge um, um, impact study, uh, there has since been another one. Uh, we're waiting for the publication, the Nelson study, which used a different algorithm that was done uh, in Europe, but also showed very significant reduction from lung cancer. Um, so next year, hopefully, I'll have that slide. The question is how you operationalize this, uh, because there are a heck of a lot of uh, uh, current and former smokers, about 90 million in the United States. Um, and clearly there are 90 million lung cancers in the United States uh, every year. So um, the question is how, how to do better. And that's where all the work is, using artificial intelligence, uh, developing risk models. Here's one that uses age, sex, family history, emphysema, the nodule type that helps identify those who are at highest risk, who who we can then continue to screen or perhaps enter onto chemo prevention trials. So how do we move forward with all of these pieces of information that I told you? What is still missing for lung cancer is truly understanding the biology and the natural history of the disease. It's not just smoke versus not smoke. There are many different molecular subtypes of lung cancer. We don't understand the molecular, um, the, the molecular uh, analysis of the pre-malignant lesions. Um, and so there is an ongoing effort to study those lesions, needs to be done over time. I showed you some of the examples of the clinical trials we're doing, but they have not, uh, it's uh, too many variables thus far. We're starting to sample the abnormal field using OMIC technologies, but um, the clinical trials models uh, can still do much better. Uh, ultimately, we're going to need to focus at molecularly homogeneous cohorts, and that is uh, work uh, being done. Um, and we need to consider that the smoker is actually an entire person, not just the lungs. They're at risk for multiple cancers, multiple chronic diseases, and so the interventions that we choose need to take all of that into account. Um, so. Uh, where the work is uh, going on now is looking at which of these pre-malignant lesions progress versus those that don't. Um, here's one study which shows that uh, lesions that are present at multiple times uh, or multiple sequential biopsies are much more likely to actually um, uh, develop into squamous cell carcinoma. Sort of makes sense, but you have to actually prove that uh, uh, with a well-done study. So the molecular analyses of these persistent versus uh, uh, regressive lesions is, uh, I think, very critical. So let me sum up. Tremendous progress has been made uh, in understanding lung carcinogenesis. Um, it is a much more complex disease than even the complex pathological uh, classification suggests, and there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in these individual tumors and in premalignant lesions which is part of the reason why we're not 
uh, curing people or preventing them quite so effectively. Um, precision medicine is applicable to a significant but still small subset of advanced cancer stage patients um, with increased survival. These are still the early days of immunotherapy. The prolonged survival is really in a small subset of patients. And whether we can take what we've learned and move it to prevention is yet to be determined. Um, CT screening is here to stay, um, um, but we need to figure out how to best uh, move it into a whole population or in, uh, into a, a population based uh, uh, effort. Um, and finally, uh, we um, have a lot of work left to do, but we now have new tools and targets uh, for chemo prevention, and so this field is moving forward. And that's it. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because we're still not curing people effectively enough. Questions? Thank you, Riva. Any questions? Perhaps you could comment on the different subtypes and how they respond to drugs, such as with immunotherapy. I read several papers that say that's best in squamous cell carcinoma. So um, the early studies were done separately in squamous versus non-squamous. Um, there is a lot of data about certain drugs, pre-immunotherapy, for instance, pemetrexid, very useful in adenocarcinomas, non-squamous, not so much in squamous. Uh, you know, uh, immunotherapy is effective in adenocarcinomas too, and it's fairly similar. I think a better uh, um, classification is smoker versus non-smoker, or the targeted uh, or the um, the never smoker abnormalities like EGFR mm -hmm. plus. Those do not respond well. So there's about um, I don't know 30 percent of adenocarcinomas that really don't respond well at all which are the never smoking, uh, um, mm -hmm. in never smoking people who respond to targeted agents. So it's not as simple as squamous and non-squamous, but targeted, uh, targetable mutations are generally um, excluded from all the studies. So regarding the findings, um, when you have a gra ground glass opacity, mm -hmm. although it's like nodular, um, I was thinking it may be something else, like an inflammation or like a Could be. like remnant of pneumonia. So there is any way you can differentiate like pre-malignant lesions compared with like an inflammation. I know that sometimes you use like functional studies, like a PET scan or something else to like. Right. So PET scan um, is uh, uh, limited by size. Usually, things that are less than a centimeter don't show up on PET scan, even if uh, they're uh, metabolically active. So that's one problem. So the ground glass opacities that well, we've been targeting for chemo prevention are generally fairly small. The other thing is that um, low-grade adenocarcinoma, such as bronchoalveolar carcinoma, um, uh, minimally invasive uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, tend to be uh, not very PET avid. So even if they're large enough, um, the PET can be negative. And that doesn't mean that it's not an adenocarcinoma. So PET is usually not in the differential for the, or, or it's not a useful uh, technique for the really small lesions. So what we tend to do with those small lesions is to follow them over time, you know, and, and that's uh, sort of the main thing that is done is to look at the rate of growth. Um, and at some point you sort of spread out how long uh, it takes. So that's why you saw that three month CT scan in that series that I sent you. The first thing you do is three months, then you do another one at six months or nine months, and then you do them yearly over time. There are some new studies. There is a um, glucose uh, receptor, a uh, gl glucose transporter that is being studied at UCLA, SGLT2, um, which appears to be active uh, in the premalignant AHH and early adenocarcinomas. And then you switch over to uh, uh, GLUT1, uh, GLUT which is a different glucose transporter, which is what PET scan will detect. Um, so there are studies looking at functional images, but nothing that's uh, approved yet. We just really do repeated um, CT scans. Okay, Eva, that'll do it. Thank you. All right, thank you.
And our next speaker is Frank Maldarelli. He got his PhD from the City University of New York, an MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He did a residency in internal medicine at the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, New York. He then came to NIH and joined NIAID, first as a staff fellow, and then he joined the HIV drug resistance program. And he's going to talk to us today about retroviruses. Frank. Thanks a lot, and um, I, I guess you think it might be for a, a Traco lecture series that, well, viruses may not be the first thing you think of, it I think is, is important on a number of levels in terms of how we see disease and even in a very practical way how we, uh, how we work in the laboratory. So, and, and I may ask you, uh, is, is anybody directly involved in laboratory research? I know this, this group gets so many different kinds of people. You're, you're in the lab and you guys, and all of you, because sometimes there are policy people here, sometimes there's everybody, so sometimes it helps. So, um, I guess uh, what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is uh, talk about the molecular biology and how this virus replicates, why it's so important to understand uh, in terms of uh, uh, where we are and how it uh, infects individuals, what these retroviruses do in human populations, how they emerged and how they spread, and then uh, a little bit about therapy and some lessons that might be useful across uh, disciplines. So. Um, uh, I'm going to first talk about uh, HIV, but just realize that it's not the only human retrovirus. Uh, it's just the one that uh, probably has the most impact in human disease, uh, and uh, a total of approximately 37 million people uh, are infected with HIV presently. Uh, they're not uniformly distributed across the, uh, the world. As you can see, most of the epidemic in terms of total individuals is concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa where over uh, 25 million of the 37 million people uh, are, uh, are located. Uh, other areas such as Southeast Asia, 5 million, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and then Eastern Europe, 1.5 million. We have, along with Central Europe, about 2.4 million, so about a million people in the United States are now currently living with, uh, uh, with HIV. On therapy, and I think uh, that's uh, listed here in the next slide, is uh, a much more encouraging number. So uh, over the last few years, because of a number of initiatives, global ones, uh, and some driven by the, the United States, uh, approximately close to half of all people now infected with HIV have access to and are on effective uh, combination antiretroviral therapy. And so this sets up, I think, a, um, uh, uh, first of all, it, it has decreased the, uh, the transmission of HIV. It's decreased, obviously, morbidity and mortality from the disease. And it sets up some new challenges as well. So um, it becomes a challenge in, on a number of levels. And here, just in the United States, I think the point is, is that because there isn't as much morbidity and mortality, and because the same number of people are getting infected every year, about 38,000. Uh, but deaths are only in the range of 64, 6,500 per year in the United States. That means that the overall prevalence of HIV is, uh, is increasing. And I think if you take anything from this lecture in terms of a, a public health understanding of this disease. It's, it's encapsulated in a, um, a, a, a column graph of this sort. And they have them for the whole world, for the United States, and for individual countries. It's called the Gardner State of Engagement in HIV care after Gardner who developed it, or the State of Engagement. And basically it says how many people uh, are infected and what's their uh, disposition in any given country. So in the United States, about 1.1, uh, 1 1.2 million people uh, are infected. That's an estimate. How many of them are actually know their diagnosis? And so that's, uh, that's this next bar here, somewhere around 900,000. So we're getting very close 
to 90% of all infected individuals know their diagnosis. But uh, okay, so it's a challenge to get that last 10, 12%, but do we have other challenges? And here's the next one. How many of those people are actually diagnosed? They know they're HIV infected. How many of them are actually linked to care? And there's where we fall off again and hear about 600,000, maybe only about 60% uh, of individuals who are infected are actually linked into care. And those who are linked in care, how many of them are retained in care? And now we're down to about 400,000 or maybe 30% of the total. Uh, of those 30% uh, that are retained in care, how many should be getting antiretroviral therapy? And now uh, due to a lot of uh, new research, we, uh, that, that number is the same. So everybody who's in care should be on uh, therapy. Okay, well, right, how many are? And maybe it's only down around to about three, uh, 300,000. So maybe 25% of everybody who's infected. And then of those people who are on antiretroviral therapy, how many of them are adherent, suppressed, and will not be transmitting this virus uh, to, under, uh, to other people? And that's somewhere around 250,000 individuals. So at each step of the way, we can see, oh, you know, we see our limitations. We see our challenges as well as our successes. And you can see that on, um, on a public health level, these challenges are both uh, so, social, medical, and even uh, uh, reach into the laboratory. Just consider that of those people who are on antiretroviral therapy and are not suppressed, they'll develop drug resistance. For them, we're going to be needing uh, new drugs, new approaches for therapy. And so based on, uh, on graphs like that around the world, uh, HHS, the people who supplies all of our um, salaries, and, uh, and support has developed four distinct areas for HIV uh, uh, research and strategies in the, in, the, in the coming, I would say the, this thing gets revised about every four or five years. And so uh, some of them cut across these disciplines, but they really have specific goals. So if you're interested in going into HIV research, pick some of these and start thinking about grants. So the first one, Reduce the incidence of HIV. You saw um, we have about 38,000 people a year that are infected. The goal is to reduce that to zero. Develop next generation therapies. You saw we have drug resistance. We need uh, new, uh, new therapies and new approaches to therapies. Perhaps you've heard some of the drugs now have ex exceedingly long half-lives. And if our problem is, is adherence and we only have to give it once every several months, that might be a real advance. Um, because the prevalence of the disease is increasing, 38,000 a year, only 6,000 die. Each year we add about 32, 33,000 people to, the, uh, uh, to HIV prevalence. Those folks are gonna be on antiretroviral therapy forever to suppress the virus. Those folks uh, will have side effects from those medications as well as other HIV associated illnesses why not um, uh, research toward a cure? And, the H and NIH is heavily invested in that. And then finally, uh, HIV is associated with a number of comorbidities, co-infections, and complications. And so research into that is another major uh, initiative for, um, uh, uh, for uh, research into HIV. And this lists a number, just some examples of what, um, uh, of what is currently being researched in HIV. So if um, this is essentially a blueprint going forward, if this is something that you're interested in, find something you like here, find a challenge and overcome it. Uh, our group here at uh, uh, the HIV Dynamics and Replication Program within NCI is heavily involved in uh, research toward a cure, but the NIH has also has broad initiatives in reducing incidence uh, and HIV comorbidities and some to developing new therapies. So um, with that introduction, I'd like to talk a little bit about how the, uh, the virus replicates because I, I don't know how the questions on this, is there an exam for this, Terry? Do you give tests? I'm, I, I didn't have the nerve to ever ask. <laughs> but if, if, if I was gonna ask questions, these are like factual things that are relatively uh, straightforward. But it's also 
useful to understand because I think that, that notice that you guys are a lot of lab workers knowing this developed everything we have in terms of therapy uh, for HIV. So if we were going to characterize retroviruses, we'd say that they're a group of RNA viruses that replicate via DNA intermediate using reverse transcriptase. Now, before you came here today, did, did you know that already? Was that a surprise? Is this a surprise? This is a thing. This is a, a virus that replicates it's an RNA virus that replicates through a DNA intermediate. And when it was first, um, when this was really came to light in the late 1960s, it wasn't all that much, you know, 15, 20 years after DNA was discovered. And so the idea that, um, that had been promulgated to that point was that, well, we have DNA, and that makes RNA. You know, you've seen that RNA code thing, DNA, RNA, protein. That's the natural order of things. And along comes this virus that replicates by starting out as RNA, then going to the DNA, then going to RNA, and, uh, and then off into proteins. And so the enzyme that actually does that makes DNA out of RNA. And because it does that, they, uh, they describe it as uh, reverse transcriptase, something that takes an RNA molecule and moves it into a DNA um, a molecule. But... Um, in reality, um, that enzyme may actually answer an ancient uh, challenge, a question that's raised by how we understand uh, organisms today. And, uh, but certainly it's a different paradigm for replication. And the, the answer or the challenge was, uh, uh, was this enzyme central for us, and when I say us, I mean, everything on a planet that's alive and has a, uh, a genome, was it important for us to transition from the initial set of organisms uh, to the ones we have today? And so what I'm referring to is that, and maybe you all know this, is that, yeah, we have all these protein enzymes, but we also have uh, nucleic acids that act as enzymes, ribozymes. They're all um, uh, RNA molecules that can uh, exert a catalytic effect. And in, in terms of um, uh, evolution, they seem to be the oldest available enzymes. And there's a, a, a theory for which there is substantial evidence that life on the planet began as an RNA world. Um, and so, you know, if, if everything is RNA, and it, maybe you, you all know, that, did you all know this already? Am I just like telling you stuff you already know? All right, I, I'm gonna tell you again anyway. So, in theory, the planet did not always look like this, right? It was um, initially a very highly reducing atmosphere, no oxygen, and uh, the first organisms themselves, at least by this uh, theory, were RNA organisms. All right, so you make RNA, you make more RNA. As long as there's not a lot of oxygen around, you'll probably be all right. The minute there's a little oxygen, then um, that acts to be able to, uh, to cleave RNA. I don't know how many of you work with it in the laboratory, but the minute you synthesize it, it starts to degrade. Um, so uh, the initially in this greatly reducing atmosphere on this planet, we did fine. But the first organisms, their uh, side products were molecular oxygen. So molecular oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere and essentially their poop was gonna kill them. Uh, and so one theory is that reverse transcriptase or reverse transcriptase-like enzymes that could convert, that could use RNA and make a DNA copy that was more stable in this uh, atmosphere that was now um, uh, becoming more and more uh, filled with oxygen, those were the organisms that were gonna survive this, uh, uh, this period. And so if you look at um, the existent um, uh, phyla in the world, and this is like if you ever did leave the NIH campus, if you were allowed to leave the lab and actually have a day off, you might go to a park. This is one up off uh, uh, Clapper Road in Great Seneca uh, Park. And every living thing you could see has in its genome a reverse transcriptase. 
an enzyme that can turn RNA to DNA. And maybe that's the remnant of, uh, of, what, uh, of what saved this planet. But um, uh, in, in this, by the same token, in addition to that, there are viruses of, uh, uh, that use that enzyme in their replication. And um, uh, uh, here's the, here are the ones that are uh, infect uh, uh, mammals and uh, invertebrates. And so you can see there are seven major families of retroviruses, and the ones listed in bold, I think you can see, are the ones that actually infect humans. And so the, the, the important point, how many people have seen a family tree like this, or a phylogenetic tree? Different branches means, you know, they're, uh, they're different by, uh, uh, by their sequences. And I guess the point I wanted to make is the ones that, that infect humans are not all on the same branch. They're as widely diverse as the ones that infect other animals. So we have uh, spumaviruses that can infect humans. They're similar to infections, uh, retroviruses of mice. Lentiviruses that include HIV um, and simian immunodeficiency virus, they form a, a large group that's not anything like them. And they're more related to viruses of other primates or of mice or of chickens or of cows. And then there's a third uh, uh, large group called uh, HTLV or human T-cell leukemia virus discovered in Japan and right here on this campus um, that's much more similar to a bovine leukemia virus than it is to anything else. So um, these uh, viruses are not concentrated in species. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, they are spread across them. If we cone down now on that group of viruses that HIV belongs to, again, there's a, there's a variety. And um, they're all immunodeficiency viruses, the I and the V in each one of their names. But you can see, you know, you sort of pick out, oh, here's one, HIV-1. Here's another, HIV-2. Two large groups of viruses that infect humans but are not anything like uh, each other. They're only about 50% uh, homologous. In fact, uh, HIV-1, the one that infects about 36 of the 37 million people uh, on the planet with an immunodeficiency virus, um, is very much like a virus that's been identified in chimpanzees. Uh, and then we have a second group that infects humans. It's much more like a virus that infects uh, sooty mangabees, a monkey. So uh, once again, the viruses that infect humans are not necessarily all phylogenetically uh, related. They are likely to be the results, as we'll see, of independent zoonotic events in which uh, uh, contact between those species allowed the virus to transmit. The, uh, the viruses are, uh, are listed by, con or, or retroviruses are described by conventions. And so if you ever read anything about these viruses, you'll see this kind of stuff. And I list a little bit of it, uh, but I wanted to mention it because it helps us understand exactly how this virus replicates. So now, if, if imagine that this is the, um, a, a cartoon depiction of the RNA that's encoded in the virion. And you see a couple of things initially. Uh, there's like three letter abbreviations, most of which I don't understand. Those represent the open reading frames for the virus. And then there are these larger blocks at either end. That's not uncommon for viruses. Uh, and they generally have uh, regulatory uh, nucleic acid sequences. But there's something funny here, right? And the funny thing is, is that this is the five prime end and this is the three prime end of the RNA. And over here, I've depicted it not by mistake. The poly A sequence in the RNA is at the five prime end. It's in this region uh, called U5. And uh, if, uh, uh, directly upstream from that is another region called R. And then if you look at the other end, there's a U3 region. That has the promoter in it. And then we have this uh, R region again. Now, I guess it, it tells a lot about retrovirologists. They are concrete people. They are very concrete people. They see something and they name it. R stands for repeat. In other words, there's about 150 nucleotides that's directly repeated here and here. We'll call that a repeat region. 
U5, well, it's not repeated. We'll call that a unique region in the 5 prime A, U5. Um, that makes U3 easy, right? U3 is the unique region of the 3 prime A. Okay, once they had the sequence and the map of that, that was fine, but that didn't explain why the poly A region was up there and the promoter is down here. The way the virus replicates explains this doing it backwards approach. So uh, regulatory nucleic acids at either end, coding sequences in the middle, you'll notice that there are many, many overlapping reading frames. So that's what it looks like in RNA. Now, if you map that same virus, once it's infected the cell, it reverse transcribes its RNA into DNA. That DNA molecules is inserted into the host genome. Here's what it looks like when it gets to the host genome. A little bit more understandable. The U3 region, R and U5, form what's called a long terminal repeat. Now it's exactly duplicated at both ends. There's that R region that we saw before. Here's the U5 that we saw before. But now the U3 is here and here. And the U5 is here and here. This whole thing is directly repeated at either end. Now the promoter, which we only had over here, is also at the 5 prime end. Okay, well, you can have a promoter at either end. But we're a little bit more comfortable with it there. The poly A sequence here is now duplicated here in a place where it's much more useful for the RNA that's going to be made from, uh, uh, from this promoter. Uh, the integrated genome here is called the provirus. The names of genes are in lowercase italics. The protein gene products that they code for are, uh, are capitalized. So you'll see this as a convention in papers and you say, why is it like that? And the reason is, again, because these people are very concrete. They wanted a way to distinguish the genes from the gene products. They wanted a way to describe these regions. How you get from here to here is central to understanding the replication of the virus and uh, it part of its uh, uh, part of its charm. I'll skip this part. This is just a glossary. If you end up reading a lot of um, uh, 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 papers about uh, either HIV or other retroviruses, you can you know refer back to this. It tells you what the genes are and what the regions in uh, the regulatory RNAs are like. Well, that's the genome. Here's what it. Uh, this is sort of an artist's depiction of the virion itself. It's about um, 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, it's an enveloped virus, and it has on its surface, the envelope is derived as it buds out of the infected cell. On its surface, it has uh, these uh, surface molecules. They're called envelope molecules because they sit on the envelope. They're encoded by HIV, and they're involved in attachment and fusion of the virus. On the inside is a... Uh, uh, a core um, uh, structure that's made up of uh, viral protein. Inside the core is uh, these two RNA molecules. When they replicate, they'll be making uh, the DNA. The, vir the virion takes with it all the enzymes it needs to make the uh, initial replication cycle. So to get that RNA into DNA, it brings everything with it. Everything else is a negotiation with the infected cell, as we'll see. So uh, the, the early steps in HIV replication, you know, you could sort of think in your health, yes, I have this virion, it has to, has to get inside, has to make its RNA into DNA, has to integrate. Well, uh, when we break those steps up, we find specific places where viral products are essential and um, where we could sort of develop a drug to inhibit so if you take a look at the virion on the outside, the first thing it has to do is attach and then enter the cell. And as it turns out, those things are separable events. The next thing it has to uh, uncoat and reverse transcribe its DNA. It has to integrate that. It has to express its RNA uh, from that integrated provirus. It has, that has to be translated. The, the virus has to be assembled. And then it matures and it buds out of uh, the infected cell. So it turns out attachment and entry are two different 
uh, phenomenon, and we need both viral factors and host cell factors. On the virus side, we need a, a, an envelope glycoprotein that sits on the surface. It has a molecular size of about 120,000 Daltons, and it's a glycoprotein, so these concrete individuals called it GP120. Also on the surface is a second envelope protein that's non-covalently associated with the GP120. It has a molecular size of about 41,000 Daltons, and uh, it's called GP41. Those two things are uh, non-covalently linked, sit on the surface. Uh, host cell factors that we need for attachment and entry are a receptor and a co-receptor. So simply engaging the receptor is not enough. It has to engage a co-receptor, a second molecule on the surface of the cell, and that can, uh, the receptor is one, CD4. The co-receptor can be one of a number of things, either CXCR4 or, uh, or CCR5. When it attaches to the cell, uh, it does that through GP120. GP120 engages CD4 and the co-receptor, uh, and that sets up but does not drive the virus into the cell. In fact, um, that is just simply an attachment, a binding step. So that's a unique event. It requires a, a viral protein. Well, that's a target. And so antibodies have been developed that actually bind to the CD4 cell receptor, not to the envelope, but by binding CD4, they block the binding of the GP120. And they do it in a kind of an elegant way because CD4 is needed for other things other than being a receptor for HIV. It's needed in all kinds of signaling uh, events. This drug, it, uh, approved in the last year or so, ibilizumab, is able to bind to CD4 without interfering with its uh, CD4's uh, signaling functions. And so right at the get-go, there's a way of preventing HIV uh, to be um, uh, uh, attaching to the cell through CD4. There's a second attachment that's required to the, uh, the co-receptor, and there's a second drug that's been developed to inhibit that. That one's called Maraviroc. It only blocks one of the co-receptor interactions. Uh, HIV can use one of two. Most of the time, it uses this uh, cell surface molecule called CCR5, and this drug, Maraviroc, blocks that uh, interaction. So even before the virion gets inside the cell, we have two and then a third place where the virus can be, uh, replication can be interrupted. So I mentioned that the second glycoproteins on the surface, GP41, non-covalently linked to GP120. Up till now, GP120 has done all the work. It's interacted with CD4. It's interacted with the co-receptor, either CXCR4 or CCR5. Once that happens, once those two things are engaged, that causes a second change in the GP120 that's, uh, that is, um, uh, causes a, a change in uh, GP41, now GP41, um, and I know it sounds dopey, it springs into action. It uh, exposes six helices that actually have in the helix a great deal of potential energy. The potential energy in those helices is actually going to force the virion membrane to fuse with the host cell membrane. That a uh, fusion event allows now the two membranes to open up and whatever's inside the virion goes inside the cell. And so um, that's a central event in replication. Again, it's a very specific one. It requires these uh, um, well-conserved uh, alpha helices. And, uh, uh, and as a result, there's a drug that's been developed that actually binds within the helix in the opposite orientation, essentially uh, forming a uh, monkey wrench that's thrown into the ability of this thing to fuse. So once that, uh, that drug is present, it, uh, it prevents fusion. The drug itself is not so easy to take, because as you might imagine, a peptide is not something you can, um, you can swallow. 
It has to be injected. It's uh, sub-Q, and it's uh, uncomfortable. Uh, it's also 36 amino acids in length, and it turns out, up till now, it's the longest peptide made for uh, pharmaceutical use. So you can imagine the, you know, when somebody, it wasn't just that, oh, wow, we looked, we figured out this mechanism, let's develop a drug. It's more like, we're desperate. We'll even build a factory to build a, a, a molecule that's 36 amino acids, knowing that we're going to have to inject it at the end of the line. We're still going to go to all those trouble, all that trouble, because we have, uh, we need as many drugs as we can get uh, for this virus. It was developed, I guess now it's, it's going on 20 something years. And with new drugs, it helped bridge things. But in, the, uh, in this day and age, it's, it's not used very much uh, at all. But it's a spectacular example of knowing an event and developing a drug based purely on a mechanism uh, that was identified in the laboratory. So once again, you know, this is one of those times where there is very little distance between the laboratory and the, um, uh, and the clinic. So uh, after those three events, three separable, distinguishable, and inhibitable events, uh, the HIV core is unloaded into the cytoplasm and reverse transcriptase takes place. Now this, you might think this is an old slide, and it is. There's new data. Uh, and I'll update it because I'm a bad man, I didn't do it, that suggests that this process of reverse transcription may not actually take place in the cytoplasm at all. That the core, uh, and this is work of, again, NCI colleagues in Frederick, Wene Patak, uh, and his colleagues have found that uh, it's possible for that core to travel all the way to the nucleus entirely intact, and largely intact, getting into the nucleus itself and reverse transcription is likely takes place either directly at the nuclear membrane or within the nucleus itself. <coughs> either way, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, uh, takes uh, these two RNA molecules and makes a DNA molecule um, out of them. And that uh, reverse transcription event uh, yields a um, uh, uh, a DNA molecule that's subsequently uh, uh, in, uh, integrated into the host genome. The process has to begin with something that we call uncoding. It's half the reason I bring in, I bring this jacket. So some people go like this, some people start on the other side. Uncoding is a very poorly described event. Nobody's really too sure how it works. However, if we did, we'd have a terrific target to prevent HIV uh, from infecting. And I'll, uh, I'll give you an example of that. How terrific is it? That's what you guys are for. It's a terrific example. How terrific? I'll tell you how. It's fundamental to virus replication. It restricts virus replication orders of magnitude. It's literally the source of the host range restriction of HIV and some of those monkey viruses to transmit to either humans or not. And once again, it requires interactions between the virus. In this case, it's group antigen gag. The thing that makes the core has to interact with or not a cellular protein called trim 5 alpha. And here, this, uh, this table kind of explains why I'm a little excited about that uh, that uncoding event and that protein trim 5 alpha. Consider this table. HIV interacts with human cells and you get an infection. HIV can be incubated with chimp cells or chimps and we get an infection. But if you try and infect a monkey with HIV, you don't get anything. You can't infect monkey cells and monkeys don't get infected with HIV. All right, let's try another line here. How about the virus that's in chimps? It's called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, CPZ. Can that infect humans? Sure can. Can that infect chimps? Yes. Doesn't infect monkeys very well at all. How about the, the virus that does infect monkeys? Well, that infects monkeys really well. It infects humans. We're not doing real well on this slide, is all I'm saying. And it poorly infects uh, chimps. This entire slide, the results of this slide, 
are the, are, uh, can be derived from the interactions of the HIV core with that protein trim 5 alpha. We got to trim 5 alpha, chimps got to trim 5 alpha, monkeys got to trim 5 alpha. The monkey trim 5 alpha binds to the human immunodeficiency virus, prevents its uncoating, and prevents the infection. The chimp, nah, that's so good. The human, not at all. Um, the, the monkey uh, trim 5 alpha can also restrict, restrict the chimp virus. The monkey trim 5 alpha cannot restrict the SIV strain. In other words, if all we, if all we needed was the monkey's trim 5 alpha, 37 million people on the planet would not have HIV infection. It would have been restricted on the way. Uh, to reverse transcription. On the way to the nucleus, we could have stopped all of this. How come we got such a bad trim 5 alpha? Well, first of all, how bad is it, Frank? I don't know if I have it here. Um, yeah, uh, how bad is it? It's probably one, maybe two amino acid differences between the monkey trim 5 alpha and ours. In other words, for the want of a nail, we lost. The war. Because of these two amino acid changes, the human trim 5 alpha cannot restrict HIV uh, and, um, uh, and the monkeys can. Well, how, did we get just unlucky or what's going on here? And the theory is really much more interesting than being unlucky. The theory is, and if you look at the trim 5 alphas of humans, of monkeys, all the way down to lower primates and beyond, you'll see that, you know, all kinds of genes undergo evolution. Trim 5 alpha is undergoing the fastest evolution of any gene that's ever been described. So you know what cytochrome C is. You can all judge, you know, how far away we are from each other based on very well uh, conserved pro That's not this one. This one changes a lot. The working hypothesis is, is that our population, our species, other species are constantly being invaded, constantly over millions of years, being invaded by vi waves of virus infection. And the people or the animals that survive are the ones that can resist those viruses. Basically, what this theory says is we have a crummy trim 5 alpha now, but it was the bomb a couple of million years ago, and it saved our population from a wave of infection back then. Probably many individuals were infected, a ton died, some survived, here we are. But that didn't, uh, those, uh, uh, the trim 5 alpha of the past couldn't predict the future. And so um, uh, this is Charles de Gaulle, generals are always fighting the last war. Yeah, they're fighting the last war because they won it. So we won the last war against the last wave of virus infection. That doesn't tell us what we need to uh, prevent us from getting the next one. And so this has informed a great deal of research into finding ways to block that on coding. It's a protein-protein interaction. It's not an enzyme, so it's not as easy to, uh, to develop drugs. So evolution solved the problem of the last wave, but it, we don't have that kind of time. Uh, so we're working on, we work on drugs instead. So reverse transcription now uh, is a process to take those two RNA molecules and make uh, a, a DNA molecule out of it. And the dirty little secret is those two RNA molecules are not complementary to each other. They're identical to each other. And reverse transcription starts at one end um, and through a, a more complex process than I think uh, uh, Terry's course deserves, turns uh, this, uh, that RNA into a DNA molecule in the process copying both ends so that at the end we have uh, these long terminal repeats that bring the, uh, the promoter to the five prime end and the poly A sequence to the three prime end. When that DNA is completed, it's reverse transcription event. Um, the ends are bound by a protein called integrase that HIV brings with it into the, uh, to the cell and into the core. And, um, uh, and then that, uh, uh, that molecule uh, uh, integrates into the host uh, genome. And it probably does it by, uh, by nearly circularizing the DNA because it has to attack a single place in, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the genome. Uh, 
uh, and I'll get into that in a second. I just want to point out the reverse transcriptase has a number of uh, uh, polymerization activities. It's an RNA dependent DNA polymerase. It has to chew out the RNA after it makes the, the DNA copy, so it has an RNase activity. It needs to turn DNA into DNA. First it takes RNA and makes DNA, then it takes the DNA and makes the second copy of DNA. It's kind of interesting that an RNA virus can't make RNA. So it can turn RNA into DNA, it can take DNA into DNA, but it can't take anything and make RNA. Reverse transcriptase of retroviruses can only make DNA, can make it from RNA or DNA. Its error rate is somewhere, it's pretty error prone. It makes a mistake every about 100,000 bases. And as polymerases go, that's about four or five logs less faithful than our DNA polymerase. Dirty little secret is anything that uses RNA as a template. So any of the RNA viruses, they have the same problem. If you're trying to make anything out of RNA, you're going to have a relatively high error rate. Recombination can occur during reverse transcription, uh, permitting a great reassortment of sequences. So replication is error prone. It's also rapid. In individuals, the virus replicates about once a day. And uh, the, the outcome of a rapid and error prone replication program is that there are mutants everywhere. Most of the things that the virus makes on a daily basis can't replicate again. The good ones, nah. There's maybe a million to 10 million infected cells in an individual giving its genes to the next generation. Most of what it does is not infectious, but about a million to 10 million make it to the next one. There's a host of variants that may not be uh, great, but they're good enough and they replicate. So the population of HIV in an individual is quite diverse. That's a um, pathogenic determinant for the virus. And here's an example of that. And you guys, you already gave it up. You said you work in a lab. So I assume you know everything about the triplet code and uh, uh, genetic information. But consider a one position in the reverse transcriptase. It's a position 151. And normally there's a glutamine there. That's a CAG. OK, fine. Well, it tolerates an, uh, an A to T change into CTG. And it, there's a leucine instead of a glutamine. And that's OK with the virus, right? Or there's an AAG. Instead of, so a C to A change, and instead of a glutamine, there's a lysine. No biggie. One change from here, AAG or CTG to ATG, we have a methionine. All four of these are tolerated by the virus. This one's the most common, probably 99.99% of all. But that's, you know, there's thousands of these others, right? So. As it turns out, when we start a drug therapy, it will suppress this one, this one, and this one. But our drug therapy to inhibit uh, this enzyme will never suppress this one. So before you give the first pill, you've already got viruses that are resistant on, um, on a single nucleotide change to most of the drugs that we have. Well, that means that we should never be able to suppress the virus. But there's only one or two of them in any genome. So if we use three drugs, three different targets, we should be able to, in a game of so-called whack-a-mole, we should be able to knock this virus down. As it turns out, that's exactly the case. So um, that reverse transcription event, even though it's rapid and error prone, is a pathogenic determinant for the virus. Yeah, for drugs, but also for the immune system, right? So if you have a wide, uh, highly diverse population and an immune system that's trying to inhibit it, it's always steps ahead of it. When you develop a, a, you know, a highly active antibody or CTL response, it's already got a host of variants that, have, uh, that are resistant to it. Uh, so the integration event, uh, you know, the DNA has to be integrated into the host genome. Again, a central event in retrovirus replication. Again, 
um, uh, an event for which is unique to the virus. So we can develop drugs for that. These are some of the most potent agents we have for uh, HIV therapy uh, uh, inhibiting this reaction. And so that here I just want to go briefly through the late steps in virus replication because once the virus is integrated, the enemy is within. And at this point, it's going to co-opt cellular processes. It's going to use its gene products to help things along, to drive things, but it needs the cell at this point. It has to make its RNA. It uses RNA polymerase. It does it by driving uh, high levels of uh, transcription through one of its proteins called TAC. The RNA is made. It's got to get out into the cytoplasm. It gets dragged through the nuclear membrane by a, cellu by a cellular complex uh, with CRIM, but it needs a viral protein uh, called REV. It gets into the cytoplasm. It's translated on, um, on host uh, ribosomes, and then it needs to assemble a particle. And it does that by co-opting uh, RAFs, cellular RAFs, and the escort pathway to, uh, to, to bud and mature the virion. The last step in virus replication is uh, it has to cleave all these proteins and assemble them into a virion. And you can see here an electron microscopic uh, uh, figure of viruses budding from the host uh, membrane. So here's the membrane here. And here are three virions budding out. And one thing you notice is that um, uh, they kind of look like donuts. And these are known as immature particles. Here's the mature particle with that core that I kept droning on about. Well, this is, uh, uh, this is what's going to take the next cell into infection. But uh, these look very, very different. The HIV protease needs to cleave proteins in this immature virus to make it look like this. It's an important step in virus replication because these, even though they butted out of the cell, they're virions, they're immature virions, and they're non-infectious. So if you can inhibit this process of, matur of, uh, of maturation with uh, inhibiting the protease, then you literally grab victory from the jaws of defeat. And so the, uh, the protease inhibitors were, are a very important part of, uh, of antiretroviral therapy. They stop the very last step in the virus's replication cycle, preventing things that have already budded from the membrane from being uh, uh, infectious. So, uh, so that's essentially one replication cycle uh, and the steps along the way that we can inhibit it with, um, uh, with uh, antiretroviral therapy. Where did these viruses come from? I mentioned that there were two broad groups, one that re represents about 36 million and one that represents much less geograph geographically restricted uh, to West Africa. Distinct events, likely distinct zoonotic events from, uh, from animal populations. Um, uh, just um, for one moment, I want to uh, give the other retrovirus its due, the human T cell leukemia virus, uh, distributed uh, again geographically throughout the world, uh, where it causes uh, a couple of diseases. Uh, one is a neurologic one called HDLV uh, associated myelopathy, the other one is a leukemia lymphoma. Um, and it's concentrated in a number of places. The Caribbean, uh, the um, uh, 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 Asian countries, such as uh, uh, it's disappearing because of, uh, as we'll see, we can get rid of it by uh, preventing transmission. But Japan had a, a, a big, uh, uh, was endemic there. It's endemic in Central Africa. There's a second virus that's like HTLV called HTLV2. It's ende endemic in a number of places listed here in, uh, in yellow Amerindian tribes. Although it's a retrovirus, it doesn't cause any disease at all. So in this family, one of them can either give you a neurologic disease or a, uh, a cancer. The other one duh, pretty much doesn't do anything at all. Uh, HTLV affects probably about 15 million, 20 million people in the whole world on the same order as HIV. But 
We don't hear about it as much because only a small fraction of infected individuals actually have get disease. So whereas with HIV, pretty much everybody who gets infected will die if they're not treated, 95% of the people with HTLV who get it will not have any disease at all. So uh, T-cell leukemia, uh, when it does occur in approximately 1% to 3% of all infected individuals, uh, usually takes uh, over 30 or more years uh, to infect, uh, to, to, to cause disease. Now, now, just back to HIV, how did it get into human populations? So basically what people did was to go out and survey, thinking that it came from Africa, let's find out where. So they looked at primates, uh, monkeys, and chimpanzees, and they found in chimpanzees a virus that looks very, very much like uh, HIV, and you can see it here. This is the principal HIV virus. Here are viruses that are in different uh, chimpanzee populations, and I didn't know this, but there are four subspecies of chimps uh, color-coded here. They're geographically distributed throughout Africa. These all have an HIV-like virus. This one does not, and so uh, the ones, the chimp populations that got the HIV-like virus probably got uh, a virus from monkeys thousands of years ago that eventually evolved in the chimps to be more like uh, HIV. But that occurred, that event, getting into the chimps, occurred after this population, uh, after all the chimps had evolved and this population had become geographically isolated. Probably by this... Uh, uh, across some of these rivers. This is the Niger River, uh, and apparently chimps don't like to cross rivers. So at one point, this population became isolated, and it was before um, an SIV-like virus entered the chimp population. Well, how does it get into people? There, uh, there are many opportunities for zoonotic events in humans. In, in this day and age, it's poachers. But in the past, there were always individuals looking for protein in Africa, and uh, animals, chimps and monkeys, are, are sources of that protein. It's likely that these events, sparks, may have occurred many, many times, but now with the, uh, the population increasing greatly uh, in Africa, those sparks turned into the flame and the fire that became the HIV epidemic. So, uh, so poachers can, this is a sooty mangabe where HIV-2 comes from, They'll take their animals to a place called a chop house. It's just butchering the thing. And you can imagine if there's a lot of virus in the blood that uh, the butchers and the people who prepare the food uh, would be able to get it. Uh, it's sold at places called bushmeat markets. And uh, phylogenetically, we can date the introduction of this HIV epidemic into humans from the late 1800s and the early 1900s knowing it was likely occurring before, but because there were such isolated events and isolated communities, it never took off as a, uh, 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 but why, what, why did we get so lucky was probably because there were uh, large increases in, uh, in population, but there were also non-biologic, political, economic uh, events. And so if you look at the map of Africa, in the late 1800s, around the time when we think HIV was entering the human, this one was entering in the human population. That's what the map looked like. Colonialism divided that area up uh, into uh, many different countries, in some ways isolating the people, in some ways subjugating the people, in some ways a great deal of individuals who were malnourished. And that malnourishment is a relative uh, immune suppression, probably facilitating the, the spread of the virus. Other things, so large political upheavals uh, contributed as well as malnutrition to immunodeficiency. Here's the population uh, in Africa from the 1910s, around the time when we think at first um, HIV uh, was introduced in the population, and here is how things took off. Note that this is a log scale. So the population goes from less than 10 million to uh, over uh, a billion in a very short period. The opportunities to, uh, uh, to transmit virus at that time 
made uh, the epidemic essentially inevitable. Um, uh, things like uh, development. This is the Trans-Africa Highway that brought uh, people and goods across Africa in the, uh, the 1960s and, uh, uh, and, and the virus with it. If we look at how the virus got into human populations in the United States, we, uh, there's been some very elegant phylogenetic work to indicate that the viruses that are here in the United States are not nearly as old as the ones in Africa and are slightly younger than the ones in Haiti. And so the prevailing theory is that the virus originated in Africa, entered human populations, Haiti and other countries had uh, close associations with Central Africa, sending uh, uh, workers, educators there in the 1950s and 60s, perhaps harvesting some of those viruses, bringing them here, and then uh, we uh, were subsequently infected. I think um, we're doing some work here in Washington uh, to, to look at this. I think that, that this uh, theory is a good one. Uh, I'm not sure it explains the entire epidemic. In the United States, the virus started to emerge in the early uh, 1980s. Here's a slide from the CDC in 1983, about 1,000 cases. And you could see each one of these dots represented 30 in, um, uh, in highly populated areas. Two years later, within two years, we've gone up tenfold from 1,000 to 10,000. Four years later, note that it takes twice as long to get to 100,000, as I mentioned, we have probably close to a million now. We were 90% of the way, uh, we, we had gotten to 100,000 by 1989. Within a few years, we more, we got to close to a million. Here's 95 and a half million. And you can see that the virus has uh, populated many of the um, highly populated areas, but is now moving out into uh, less populated areas. So. Uh, in the United States now, 12% of the cases are in populations of less than 50,000. Women comprise over a quarter of all the cases, and the, uh, the epidemic is maturing. Um, by now, about 50% of all the cases of HIV, living people living with HIV are over 50. It is largely an African-American uh, uh, epidemic. Therapy now has changed uh, the entire landscape. So when I first came, and I'm sure Terry doesn't remember this because he's so young, but uh, there were buses that had posters like this. If you get the AIDS virus now, you and your license could expire at the same time. Before therapy, everything was concentrated on uh, measures to prevent transmission, and those were all exclusively behavioral. Since that time, we've developed a whole uh, host of antiretrovirals that attack, as we saw, many different steps in, um, uh, 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 in replication. And now the hope is that we'll get 90% of the people who are infected diagnosed, 90% of those on therapy, and 90% of those on therapy suppressed. You saw our Gardner State of, of Care. You see where our limitations are but treatment for all will get us to zero. In the last couple of years, uh, the, what we've learned is that if you're suppressed, if your viral load is suppressed less than 50, then you don't transmit the virus. Undetectable, and I hate that term because we can always detect it, but undetectable means untransmissible. If we get those people less than 50, and keep them there, they will not transmit this virus. So the need's great, the challenge is on numerous levels. Remember this, uh, this care. Our goal is to get this uh, diagnosis up to over 90%, to get this up to over 90%, to get this up to over 90%, and that will keep uh, the, um, uh, the virus uh, from being transmitted. I think a lot, I think you saw where, where we're concentrating this big group here at NIH working on vaccines, another group uh, working on curative strategies. So our, our lessons, viruses are bad and should be avoided, except, you know, they may have saved life on this planet. Uh, and they probably saved us from the last uh, wave, 
We just have to take this one across the goalposts. Uh, epidemics are not single events. Epidemics evolve. And a detailed understanding of replication, what you guys do on a daily basis, leads to new therapies. The antivirals are useful when instituted as early as possible. Adherence is essential. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. I'm sorry to rush a little bit, but if you have questions. Any questions? Perhaps you could comment on how they get the AIDS drugs to Africa and how they're distributed. Oh my gosh. So um, we develop them, we FDA approve them, and then there were large programs that uh, brought those drugs to Africa. And they were collaborations between governments and between um, uh, funding agencies and between uh, independent um, uh, uh, funds to get money there. Like what? Okay, like what? In the, uh, the uh, early 2000s, some of you may know uh, Anthony Fauci is the head of NIAID, and he has been since the late 80s. When he saw the, um, how compelling the data were for treatment may prevent transmission, he convinced people, and there are people who are above his pay grade, it's hard to believe, that, that are above a, uh, an institute director. He convinced uh, the administration of George W. Bush that the application of money now, concentrated in Africa, can save lives. Five billion dollars was invested in Africa. At the same time, the Clinton Foundation was investing in Africa. At the same time, countries saw what things could be done. And the two examples, I think, are um, South Africa, which came late to the party and said, I only have 40 cents to spend on health care. Why should I try and spend it on antiretrovirals? And so then they had probably the worst epidemic of all, as opposed to another country in, in sub-Saharan Africa, Botswana. Now, both of the, I don't want to say, both of those countries got diamonds. And Botswana decided to spend a lot of its money on infrastructure, and it was a long-range project. 25% of the people in Botswana in 2000 were infected with HIV. A quarter of everybody. And they said, look, we're not giving up. We're going after it. And they invested a huge amount of money. They have, they got the first 90. They're getting to the second 90. They have huge... Uh, uh, impact in their population. Okay, you might say, well, when you start with 25%, there's hardly anywhere else you can go but down, you know, but lower if you do anything at all. To some degree, that's true, but they made a, um, a very long range commitment that's really reaping benefits. South Africa, all right, so they started later, but they started making the same commitments, and now, um, you know, in both of those places, their, uh, their transmissions are less. But it required an example that it could be done, us. It inquired a lot of money. And some of it came from us, some of it came from WHO, some of it came from the Clinton Foundation and other foundations. And some of it had to come from the country itself. But knowing that you could, and this was no question, this was the brilliance of Anthony Fauci. He knew when to say, what to say, and how much it was going to cost. And that saved millions of lives. There's no two ways about it. Okay, that'll do it. Great story. All right, well, th thanks a lot.